professionals here today? I love mental health professionals. I love them so much. I've been married to one for 53 years. So I, uh, I like to say that she knows more law than most mental health professionals because she was looking over my shoulder for all those years. And then she started back into her training after we had a couple of kids and I got to look over her shoulder. And so we kind of take turns on CEUs and MCLEs and go back and forth. She's retired now, but um, we still have some wonderful conversations about uh, what we're both learning together in this adventure I call life. Um, I'm here today to talk about a toolkit. A toolkit. And if somebody could help me pass out the toolkit, this is going to be paper and people. That's no electronics. Uh, kind of old-fashioned. If somebody could give me a hand, maybe Deborah, you could help out. Um, there should be one. There should be enough for everybody. I got it. I got it. There we go. So don't open the toolkit yet. We're just passing them out now. Uh, when I was about 11 years old, my mother married an Arctic explorer. He really was an Arctic explorer. He was uh, hired by the United States uh, Coastal and Geodetic Survey team, and they would go into the Arctic for four or five months out of the year in the summertime to try to define the boundaries and create the maps and uh, do all the things that hadn't yet been done in, uh, back in the 40s. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a lot of hours in the tent, I mean, when foul weather came, and the Inuit people were still quite prevalent in the area where he was, and so he decided to take up scrimshaw. Anybody know what scrimshaw is? Yeah, yeah. Somebody been to Maui? Been to Lahaina and the scrimshaw? Well, scrimshaw is the art of etching uh, whale's teeth or bone. And he thought, well, I got all these hours on my hand. I'll buy some. Uh, I'll buy the tools, the little scrimshaw toolkit. They're a lot, mostly metal, steel, black ink. You could do colors if you wanted, but he was just starting out. But what was really special was trading with the Inuit people, getting the bones, uh, prehistoric bones, prehistoric tusks, walrus tusks, uh, uh, sperm whale teeth, stuff like that. And he came back with this wonderful uh, scrimshaw set and these amazing pieces of prehistoric bone. And 40 years later, he passed away. Pancreatic cancer. This was a insurance industry statistic. He retired and died in two years. And uh, we were going through his stuff, and I found the toolkit. Now he'd shown it to me before he married my mother when he was when they were going together, and he would talk about what he was doing up there. And here was the toolkit in absolutely pristine condition. It wasn't any ink on any of the bones. These beautiful pieces of prehistoric bone and uh, whale's teeth and he had the toolkit all of those years but he never used it. He bought the kit, spent a lot of money collecting all the items for the scrimshaw but he never used the kit. So that kit was pretty worthless. I'm sure when he bought it it cost him a lot of money because it was back in the 40s. Today it's probably worth even more. Um, so I'm giving you paper today, not electronics, paper. This is a toolkit. It's just a toolkit. It's only as good as the tool maker. Now if you were to buy a toolkit at Sears and Roebuck and you bought the kit that had all the tools in it, that doesn't necessarily mean you're the master of every tool in the kit, does it? <laughs> Learning how to use the tools may be a much larger uh, challenge than simply buying the toolkit, and that's kind of what this toolkit's all about. Um, those of you that are mental health professionals, I guess that's everybody in the room, will see a lot of familiar things. But I've done some, some different things. Atul Gawande. Anybody know the name Atul Gawande? Anybody know the, um, the man checklist manifesto? Seven or eight years ago, a surgeon, a Harvard surgeon, wrote a book called The Checklist Manifesto. What he did was he, he was a World War II buff and he was reading about the Flying Fortress. 
which was developed by Lockheed during World War II, but it was so complicated that the first time they tried to fly it, it crashed. And the Arm, uh, Air Force backed off and said, no, 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 we can't have an airplane that's so complicated, nobody can fly it. They had about seven prototypes, though. So they went with another uh, aircraft with Boeing, which was a lot uh, easier to fly, but the pilots were just, they knew this aircraft had so much potential, they couldn't just ignore it. So what they started to do was something that had never been done before, a checklist of all the things that needed to be done. And that's where the checklist, the aviation checklist, was born. The aviation checklist came out of, and they, they then successfully <coughs> blew the Flying Fortress. The Flying Fortress was incomparable in terms of what it had and what it could do. And it was used all over uh, Europe and the South Pacific, and it was the most successful aircraft in World War II. But it was complicated. And it took one man reading the checklist and the second man going through, making sure it all got done. Gawande took the idea of the checklist into the surgical theater and decided, can we save more lives just by using checklists? Incredible. If you haven't read the Checklist Manifesto, a must read. It's mind boggling how many hundreds of thousands, probably by now millions of lives, have been saved because the introduction of the checklist in the surgical theater, it started at Harvard and spread out from there. It's now worldwide. It's a worldwide movement putting checklists into surgical theaters, into medical procedures, so that things don't get left. And you know, when you go in and you maybe you've had surgery, I had my cataracts done, about 15 people asked me if it was going to be this eye. <laughs> is it this eye? Which eye is it? Well, it was on the checklist. And they had all these people cross-checking. So think of this checklist as something that can be useful if you use it. It's paper. You can put it in your desk. You can keep it uh, under a stack of something or close by. Um, you're mental health professionals. And you work with people in distress. You work with people in crisis. I'm a divorce lawyer. I work with people in distress. I've worked with people in crisis. Um, but you never lose it, right? <laughs> You never lose it because you're a mental health professional. You know it all. And nobody in your family ever loses it, right? There's never any conflict in your family. I have four kids, four grandkids. Guess what? And they work at my practice. So we call our um, weekly meeting Conflict Avoidance Planning Lunch. We do that once a week. Conflict Avoidance Planning Lunch. Another book that you might want to put on your schedule. If you're working with small businesses, Small companies, small firms, the, the, the business of running the family business. It's a great book. The business of running the family business. That was another source of inspiration to me to try to do something in terms of creating peace in my office. I mean, my son's my partner, my wife writes my newsletter, my daughter's my office manager, my other son's my social media. At the end of the meeting, I'll be taking pictures with anybody that wants to take a picture. So we can put it on Facebook. And, talk about sovereign health and this great day that we had and their wonderful program and the generous spirit that is here and uh, we all help each other. Um, so the checklist is really something that it's only as good as the person who has it and decides to employ it. It's something that you can pretty much use on a daily, anytime there's a breakdown, anytime there's an upset, anytime there's a meltdown, um, when I ask lawyers this question, I see all the hands go up. You ever get that phone call where you're holding the phone out here? <laughs> Maybe therapists get those calls once in a while from the borderline, a narcissist, right? Well, um, another book that is a must read is The Art of Waking People Up. Anybody heard of that book? Ken Cloak lives right here in Santa Monica, very nearby. He teaches mediation. He's been my mediation trainer for 30 years. He teaches over at Pepperdine University, the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution. And he's written a number of books, Mediating Dangerously, Crossroads of Conflict, The Dance of Opposites, and maybe the most amazing book of all, The Conflict Resol Revolution. The Conflict Revolution. So I'm reading The Art of Waking People Up. I'm trying to build a collaborative law office where it's heterarchical, not hierarchical, because I 
I was in the military, I was a Catholic, all these hierarchical models in my life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. I see some nodding heads. Um, but what's a heterarchical business like? What's a business like where everybody is equal but have different roles and try to work together as a team? And especially if you have unresolved issues from when they were 10 years old, <laughs> which is a family business problem. So bringing in the idea of conflict management was introduced to me by Ken Cloak in The Art of Waking People Up. And he basically talked about what you needed to do and how to do it, but I kept looking through the index, where's the checklist? How do I do this? How do I really make this happen? So what you have here is a work in process. It's not complete. It started out six pages, it went to eight pages, uh, then I got up to ten pages, I said, that's it, I don't want this more than ten pages. It's 11 pages. Uh, and, and stuff keeps getting added because I, I do ask for feedback. There's a feedback form uh, in the back, and I hope that you'll uh, have the time to give me some feedback. How can I make this better? What did I say that I shouldn't have said? What should I say that I'm not saying? And maybe you have a tool that you'd like to share with me, because I'm sharing my tools with you. I want you to take these back to your office. I want you to take these back to your clients, I want you to take them back to your church, your uh, organization, um, and we do these workshops complimentary to try to get the word out that there is a new game in town, a way to resolve conflict in a planful, thoughtful way. So the first uh, list is kind of like the index, it says outline of activities, that needs to be changed to index. Introduction to conflict, a quick word, thanks to my wife. I said, conflict avoidance, conflict avoidance, she said, Ron, <coughs> there's nothing wrong with conflict. <laughs> what? I want you to think about the first time you experienced conflict as a little person. Can you think of the first time you saw conflict? Who was modeling that conflict? Who were the big people modeling that conflict? You saw that conflict, how did that affect you? What kind of an impact did that make on you? Mine was when I was nine years old on the kitchen porch in Long Beach when my father attacked me with the hose from a uh, enema tube in the bathroom. He was drunk, so he's hitting me with the hose, and my mother comes up from behind is hitting him with a skillet, an iron <laughs> skillet she pulled out of the kitchen. That was my, that's my first earliest memory of conflict. How do you resolve conflict with an iron skillet? <laughs> but two weeks later, I'm in my grandmother's kitchen in Seattle, and my mother is saying, Ronnie, we're not going back to Long Beach. I'm divorcing your father. You are going to be my little man. Um, fast forward a few years. I'm 19. I'm in the Navy. I get stationed on a destroyer in San Diego. My father's working in Long, uh, Los Angeles. He's working on the Harbor Freeway. So, hey, you know, this is great. I'll look up my father, and I did. And we'd gotten adopted. We'd moved into a new parish. The divorce was a deep, dark secret, you know, back in 1948. You know, talk about those sort of things. And so uh, nobody knew me. My mother <clears throat> had been married before, and my mother had three more kids, so it was four and three. When the oldest is seven, three brothers, three sisters. So I'm 19, and I find my father living in Los Angeles, working on the Harbor Freeway. We start going to the Croatian Palace uh, down on Imperial Street and going polka dancing and having a great time. And... So I got out of the Navy and I had a California birth certificate. LA City College was free. UCLA was 40 bucks a semester and I could ride my motorcycle for 50 cents a week on gasoline. Mm -hmm. and parking was free on UCLA campus for motorcycle. I'm not leaving California. <laughs> <laughs> I don't stand. So I stayed, went to school, went to UCLA, got my law degree, found my beloved at LACC, got married, started having kids. So fast forward another 40 years. And I'm, with, I'm talking to my mother on the telephone. Now, uh, she heard about something new. My stepfather had uh, gotten pancreatic cancer after he retired. And she heard about hospice. I never heard of such a thing. She told me all about hospice. And she was becoming a hospice novitiate so she could learn hospice and take care of my stepfather through his final days. And she said, um, how's your father? And she always did. She always asked me how my father was. And I said, oh, he's dying. What? I said, he had a heart attack. He had a stroke. He'll be gone in six months. She said, you think I should give him a call? I said, well, you're not going to believe this. 
He's living in Seattle. <laughs> he left California and went back to his sister's house, Steffi. He says, so you're in Seattle? I said, yeah. Six months later, I'm the best man. My brother gives the bride away, and my parents were reunited after 40 year hiatus. So I'm a divorce lawyer with a little different take on divorce <laughs> and conflict resolution. So I told you about Ken Cloak. I told you about how I got into this toolkit. So conflict. So my wife says, conflict is good, Ron. Conflict allows people to understand that there's a problem. It's not the conflict that's the problem. It's the way they deal with conflict. And I'm not going to spend any time on the tool in here that you're all familiar with, rules for fair fighting. I'm sure all of you have this in your office. Many of you have your own. I just happened to pick one that I liked, and then I made some changes to it. So one of the tools, we won't spend any time talking, is the, is the uh, fair fighting. And, and forming and instructing and advising people that conflict is conflict. That's what Ken Cloak talks about in the crossroads of conflict. Every conflict is there for a reason to call your attention to an event you're facing. And you're at the crossroads. You either face that conflict and deal with it, or you can avoid it, but guess what? It'll pop up again. It'll pop up again. It'll pop up again. I don't understand all of that. No, health professionals here could probably explain it to me, but I do know it's true. And so working through conflict, embracing conflict, accepting conflict, processing conflict, resolving conflict. That's what the toolkit's about. So the first thing I have after that is, in the workplace, what I found is that you have to have shared values if there's ever going to be conflict resolution. Somebody wrote a book called uh, Good to Great. Uh, Jim, I can't think of his last name. Call Good House. to Great. Who? Call Thank you. Well, he talks in the first chapter about having the right people on the bus. <laughs> you have a bus that's going from Anaheim to Albuquerque. And if you're not going to Albuquerque, you better not be on that bus because you want to go to Chicago or you want to go to New York, you need another bus. And so deciding what the vision is of the group, deciding what the mission statement is and what the values are going to be. So before you even get into the issue of resolving conflict, it's really important if you're working with families, if you're working with companies, if you're working with law firms. I've done this program for Loyola Law School. I've done it for the CSUN uh, Advanced Administration uh, MBA program. Um, I've done it for accountants and real estate brokers. Everybody has the same problem. If you have everybody flying off in a different direction, it's just not going to fly. It's not going to work. So having a set of values is the first step. So one of the things I recommend is a weekend retreat. You can do it in a half a day, but it's much easier if you can take a couple of days. Some wonderful spots here in Southern California where we can go and have a great time. And so deciding what the values. Have everybody make a list of the values that they uh, think are important. And you can buy a page, right? You can get it online. It's like there's 100 values you can just pick out. The 10 most important values. What we have here is the law collaborative, my firm. We did the exercise. We came up with the values. And we all agreed by consensus. By the way, consensus is not unanimity. You may never get unanimity. Consensus is not what I would have chosen, but I can live with it. Everybody else wants to do this. All right, I'd rather do this and be a part of the group than lead the group. Because if they really can't live with the values, maybe they shouldn't be in the group. Somebody says, uh, civility? Forget civility. <laughs> That's not part of my vocabulary. I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> I, have, I have friends from Brooklyn who claim that in Brooklyn it's different. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I think to get into the conversation, of conflict, and conflict management, and conflict resolution, you have to start on the same page. Basically, the same page is what are the uh, values of the people who are the um, shareholders, who are the stakeholders, who are the ones who have an interest in this group, in this organization, in this family. So, another preventative conflict preventative measure is the weekly group check-in. The weekly group check-in, I think, is absolutely crucial, and there's a way to do it, and the best book I know is the Facilitator's Guide. The handbook 
uh, the Facilitator's Guide Handbook. I think that's what it's called. You get it on Amazon. It's got, it's amazing. It's got 150 pages. It's got all, but what you're seeing here is just a very brief check-in. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is everybody checks in. Are, are you okay? And it's, this is just like uh, a, a 10 seconds on a scale of 1 to 10. I'm a, I'm a 1, I'm a 5, I'm a 6, I'm an 8. What would it take to get you to a 10? You know, just as if somebody's dog just died. Or they just got a foreclosure notice. Or their application was denied. I mean, people can just not be in a place to be in the meeting. Some people may need to be excused from the meeting for a variety of reasons. So that's the first check-in. The second is express appreciation. Everybody should be expressing appreciation. Why is that? Because we all want to talk about the complaint, right? And that's the human nature. But you don't start with what the problem is. You start with expressing appreciation for each other, talking about what's working, what's not working, and exploring solutions. So this is a checklist, and you see it's got spaces so you can write on this. That's what these are intended for, for you to copy them and use these as your checklist for checking in with the group. So this is a, group, a, a, a proposed weekly uh, group check-in checklist that we're using now that's working for us. Uh, I welcome feedback, ideas, suggestions, how we can improve it. But the next thing I have... Four. Four. Page four is a weekly check-in. It just got changed. We used to call it the spit and growl. And my group said, no, that's too negative, spit and growl. There was an old judge in Van Nuys who I loved being this all. And he had a weekly, he had a monthly spit and growl. When he would come out of the judge's dining room, he'd sit uh, in the public dining room at a big table, and anybody that wanted to come up and have lunch with Dave and tell him what he was doing wrong and how things weren't working, and why there was uh, blocks, and why they couldn't get things filed. And he's quietly eating lunch, and he listened to everybody. So it was an opportunity for everybody to spit and growl. Well, that's kind of what the weekly check-in is, but that's kind of negative. So we said, no, no, we'll call it weekly group check-in. So this is how you check in. But this is an opportunity to air something that's going on. You don't stop somebody and stop working to talk about a problem if it's not really interfering with the work that you're doing right there goes on your weekly check-in list, and then you have a place to go where you can talk about something that's causing a problem, something that's creating uh, difficulty, and so forth. So that's the weekly group check-in. Um, brainstorming is a tool that I picked up years ago, and this is really an expansion. This one didn't used to be in the toolkit, but when I talk about how do you explore solutions? So you take step five, explore solutions, that's brainstorming. And brainstorming is an amazing tool. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, many of you I know are. It came out, came, and it kind of went, and it was real popular for a while. Everybody was teaching it, and then kind of went away, and I don't hear anybody talking about it anymore. But the brainstorming, you know, in this room alone, <laughs> think of the expertise. Think of the knowledge. Think of the experience and the problem-solving skills. There's probably no problem on planet Earth that we couldn't solve together if we decided to work together and we had shared values. If we had shared values and we decided to work together, I, I don't think there's a problem we couldn't solve. But how do you do this in an orderly way? Well, the brainstorming checklist gives you an approach and a way to do it. And the recommended way is to do it standing because it's going to be quick. We're not going to spend all day brainstorming using a whiteboard, we have a big whiteboard uh, in our uh, office, and then one person becomes the recorder. So you appoint a recorder, and the recorder doesn't modify, doesn't amend, doesn't edit. Whatever the idea is, they write the idea on the board, because the idea is to gather information. No swamping, no negativity, it's not a debate. Oh, we tried that, that didn't work. No, 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 no. The idea is to encourage positive feedback. We could try this, we could try that, we could try a checklist, we could put a, uh, an answer, uh, a new message on the machine. I mean, whatever the idea is, we only take good ideas and you keep writing on the board as quickly and as fast as you can until everyone's empty. No swampers, no editorials, no debaters, it's just all the ideas you can come up with. 
You might wind up with 10, 12, 15 ideas. Now we prioritize. How many people like this idea? How many people like this idea? So we do a head count, we go through the list, and then we wind up with the ones that have the most people voting for it. That's how we prioritize, because we prioritize using the information from the group. And then we have a little side box, by the way. And the little side box, if somebody comes up with an idea that's not really on point, that's a good idea. We'll put it down here. We'll save it for later, because you may have another brainstorming session at another time to talk about that idea. So that's basically, I'm, I'm doing this very quickly, but um, one topic at a time. Everyone participate. There are no titles. We leave all of our titles at the door. Uh, no editing. Every idea is perfect. One voice at a time. Two people can't talk at the same time. No time limit. You go until you're empty. Prioritize by inviting stakeholders to indicate ones, twos, and threes, and then set a date. Because when you have the ideas up there, then you start coming up with the solutions. Now you decide, maybe you'll just take three things, just three things out of the 13 or 15 that you had. We're going to try these three ideas, and we're going to meet again when? And everybody can decide. Well, I think we can, we'll know in a week if that's working or not. Or maybe it's two weeks, or maybe it's a month. But the group decides when they're going to meet again to reconvene, and somebody is keeping a record, the, the secretary or the scrivener or whatever you want to call the person that's taking the notes. And that could rotate. Maybe it shouldn't always be the same person. In fact, all the roles should rotate. Facilitate and so forth. So that's this is how to explore and find solutions. Uh, you can do this uh, with your church committee. You can do this with your family. It's just a wonderful, wonderful tool that's uh, been around for a long time. A lot of people know about it, but we forget. That's why we have a checklist. That's why we have a toolkit. So we can go look at the toolkit. So now I'm going to come into conflict. What happens when the meltdown occurs? Um, what do we do when we feel that <laughs> volcano, Mount St. Helens, going off inside us? Um, step one is to stop. S-T-O-P. Stop. Observe. Pause. Prepare. Plan. So we stop. Listen carefully and completely as they express their anger, do not interrupt them. Let them speak until they're finished. This is really hard to do because we have the solution, right? We know the answer. Um, they're just confused or they miss the point or something was left out. I have a friend who says there is no problem. There is no problem. There is no problem until there is a problem. There is usually confusion misunderstanding, misinformation, uh, oversight, omission, and that's oftentimes what we have to get to, is to find out where it's missing. But when somebody is blowing up right in front of you, the last thing you want to do is to engage. You want to become the world's best shock observer. That's when you have that phone out to here, and you're listening, and taking notes. Write down everything they say. The dates, the times, the activities, whatever it is they're claiming uh, was said or done or happened or whatever, writing it all down. Until you hear on the phone or if they're in person, are you listening to me? <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, I'm not only listening to you, I'm taking notes. Would you like me to tell you what I've heard you say so far? What did you hear me say? I heard you say that uh, the letter was late. I heard you say that the letter was wrong. I heard you say that we had it all mixed up and it was all opposite of what we talked about. So I'm, I'm reading back. When they finally say, yeah, that's, that's it, I ask them, is there anything else? What else is there that you're upset about? Is there anything else you want to tell me? Have you told me everything that you have in your mind? You want to make sure they're completely empty. They need to be heard. They're upset. And once they hear that they're being heard, then they can pause and take a breath and relax. And that's the opportunity to say, well, um, I hear you're upset. Uh, I can identify with what you're saying. I'm really sorry. 
how things have worked out, and understand why you feel the way you feel. Empathy. We then introduce the idea of empathy and letting them know they're not bad, they're not wrong, they're human. They're having an emotional, a human emotional event, and we can empathize with that. Uh, what can I do to help? What can I do to make this right? How can I make you feel better? Is there anything I can do? And then you want to conclude with gratitude. I'm really sorry how things have worked out. I thank you for expressing yourself so clearly to me. I will take steps to see that nothing like this happens again. I want to thank you for your clarity and for your, uh, I appreciate your time. You're important to me and I feel badly about the situation. So it's setting aside defensiveness, it's setting aside accusation and judgment and being open and being receptive. So this is the first step and it's hard to remember all this stuff. That's why I write it down. That's why I, I keep the checklist because I need to be reminded. I have problems with this stuff. I was, uh, Marlo and I were talking at the beginning about how simple it is to solve problems. It's just not easy. It's simple, and everything you're going to see here today is simple. It's not easy. If it were easy, everyone would be doing it. So, now let's suppose you're on the receiving end. Let's suppose somebody has said something to you, and fortunately you were able to contain it. When you explode, it's the wrong place to go. I'm a big fan of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, his 800-page biography, there's a, many of biographies, the newest ones, about 800 pages. It's just amazing. You will not believe how many times you quote Benjamin Franklin in the course of a day in a conversation with you. Penny saves a penny earned. Uh, well, one of them, his most famous, is count to ten. Before you answer, count to ten. What was he talking about? He was talking about subduing the reptilian brain. We all know that there's a part of our brain that is very ancient, that is fight or flight. And more often, fight than flight. Or you know, a lot of people like me, um, who are used to combat, used to violence. That was the model we were taught when we were little people. But the exercise I do when I have a longer period of time is I have people form little groups. They talk about that first event, the first incident of violence, and then they talk about how that impacted their view of dispute resolution. How did that form their, shape their thoughts and feelings about dispute resolution? And how are they today about dispute resolution? What are the strategies, the tactics, the approaches? What are the tools that you presently use? You all have them. You may not have written them down, but you all have a tool for dealing with conflict. And how has that evolved over time? And what have you learned uh, so that it's different today than it was then? Because chances are it's very, very different. So here's the self-checking. This is a checklist. When you're the one, you're on the receiving end, you fortunately were able to stop, count to ten, you know, I'm on an important call right now. I can't discuss this, but this is important, and I do want to talk to you about it. I'll get back to you in about a half hour or an hour or at the end of the day. <clears throat> first thing I say, if you call me, or if I call you, the first thing I say is, can you talk? Mm -hmm. Today, you don't know where people are with their phones. Mm -hmm. can be in some strange places. So they may not be in a position to talk. I'm in a bank line. I'm finishing up a deposit. Oh, okay, well... I'll call you back in five minutes. So if they call you and they, they blow up and, and you're feeling that it's very, very appropriate these days to simply say, you know, that's important. We do need to talk. I just can't do it in this moment. But please allow me to call you back. It won't be that long. I'll get back to you. This is what you do then in the half hour, 20 minutes, five minutes, whatever the time is. This is the self-checking. Um, there's a uh, woman back in... Um, Emily Gould, a uh, former prosecutor, now a mediator uh, in Connecticut, Vermont, I think, or Connecticut, I don't know. Anyway, uh, Emily Gould is the author of Empathic Listening. 
So what you have here is kind of a condensation of a two-day workshop that she does on empathic listening. But the, just having these steps, first of all, what was said. I heard at an employee assistance professional's workshop a story that has stayed with me and I've never forgotten it. And an uh, employee assistant professional talked about an event that occurred in the workplace <clears throat> where John walked in and said to Bill, whew, it's hot outside today. And then Bill said to John, it's going to get a lot hotter. And John proceeded to punch Bill in the face with all of his might and flattened him. And everybody rushed in and they didn't know what was going on. And they brought in the EPA rep and it took about a week to sort it out. John was talking about the weather. Boy, is it hot outside. Bill was talking about the weather. It's going to get a lot hotter. You have no idea how hot it's going to be. John had child porn on his computer. He had just discovered somebody had been hacking his computer, and he was trying to find out who knew he was looking at child porn in the workplace. And when Bill said, it's going to get a lot hotter, he knew it was Bill. <laughs> so what's said isn't always what's heard. There are illustrations of that in your life and in mine. So the first thing to do, you notice there's space to write here. What was said, write down the exact words that were said that were so upsetting to you. What did I hear? I heard you're a creep. You're worthless. You're a jerk. You lied. I can't trust you. You're the worst piece of garbage I've ever seen in my life. What was it that you heard? And write down. And maybe it's two or three sentences. It may only be three words in the first sentence, but it might be three or four sentences in the second one. Now, self-empathy. How does that make me feel? Let's think about what that's doing to us emotionally, because we're not just physical bodies. We're not just mental bodies. We're emotional bodies. Emotions control us more than uh, our intellect. And I forget what the numbers are. Something like 70% of all decisions are emotional. Car buying, emotional. House buying, emotional. Spouse selection, <laughs> usually emotional. I was in a group uh, uh, parent, uh, a couples retreat with my wife. There were 10 couples, 20 of us in a circle, and each one talked about why they picked their particular mate. We were laughing out loud, falling out of our chairs. It was so ridiculous, the reasons people had chosen for picking their mate. And these were all long-term marriages, anyway. <laughs> How does that make me feel? Let's get a hold of the emotion. It makes me feel very angry. It makes me feel very diminished. It makes me feel very upset. It makes me feel very sad. Write down the emotion, maybe more than one emotion. You may be feeling a rainbow emotion. What is it I want? Now let's start talking about, you know, the back brain. The front brain, the reptilian brain, that's fight or flight. We, and I call that the um, reactive uh, brain. The reactive brain reacts. That's where words come out of our mouth too soon. Um, in the back, there's a place they refer to as the reflective mind. And that's where processing takes place. And that takes a little longer. And it's not instantaneous. So here's where we move in from our reactive brain to our reflective mind and start talking about what I want. Then what do I want to say? So I write down, what are the words I want to say to that particular comment or remark? And then I think about that a little bit more. What should I say? Because what I should say may not be the same as what I want to say, because I have to ask the next question. If I say that, what is it they're going to hear? What do they hear? What will they hear when I use those particular words, when I say that particular thing? And how will they feel as a result of what I say? A lot of analysis in this. This takes some time. But when you're dealing with high conflict, this is the only way I know to break it down piece by piece, step by step, process it in a rational manner that makes sense because I want to know what they're going to do and is that what I want? And then the last question, is that in the best interest of all concerned? 
Because we're really all here for the same place. When I have a couple in front of me, and they're pitchforks at each other, I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're in agreement. No, we're not in agreement. You're in agreement. How do you see we're in agreement? You want the divorce over with. Well, yeah, we want the divorce over with. And you don't want to spend a ton of money. You don't want to spend every last cent that you have. And you don't want the children to be hurt or harmed. And you'd like to have this done as quickly as possible, as affordably as possible, with the least amount of rancor. That's pretty big. Let's come from the place of where we have an agreement and see if we can work on some of these other problems. Because you've been together already so many numbers of years. You've been solving problems for a long time. Let's see if there's some way that we can turn some of that energy and some of that insight and some of that understanding and wisdom and maybe even find a little gratitude, a little appreciation because... There were some good times. It's funny, you know, if you talk to a couple who are getting ready to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary, and you ask them to tell you about their marriage, it's delightful the stories they'll tell you about their marriage. But the stories will all be positive, will all be wonderful, will all be good. Ask a couple who are filing for a divorce to tell you about their marriage. <laughs> Very different set of stories. They'll tell you some very different stories, but guess what? Both couples have both stories to tell, truth be known. So it's really a matter of trying to help them understand. So this is the self-check-in. Yes, and this is a workshop. Time Please. Or, or, or. I'm just curious, <coughs> you said that you've got a couple who is both agreeing that they want a divorce. How do you manage a couple where one wants it and the other one doesn't? Like, how do you manage that conflict? Or what is that? Win her love back. <laughs> when his love back. Okay. I mean, there was a time when neither of you loved one another, right? There was a time when you didn't even know each other, and you didn't love one another, and usually there's one that kind of does and one that kind of doesn't. So we're going to have to wind the clock back, and you're going to have to become so attractive, so intelligent, so compassionate, so empathic, so loving, so grateful, appreciative, and adoring, where are they going to find that? <laughs> I've had mental health professionals, I deal with, I work with a lot of mental health professionals. I love having a collaborative case where we get mutual, exclusive, uh, uh, limited scopes, waivers, so we can talk to each other. The client gives us permission to talk about their divorce, so the therapist and the attorney are on the same street. And the therapists that I've talked to have been doing couples counseling for, for 20 years or more, those marriages can all be saved. Unless you have Caitlyn Jenner. Those are really hard. Some of those are saved. Some of those are saved. I've had two of those, and those are really tough cases. Because first he's not interested in women, he just wants to be a woman. And he thinks that they'll be best friends, and that's fine too. And then he goes through the hormones and starts getting attracted to men. Uh, women, yeah, attracted to women. And so, anyway, those are, those are, we shouldn't be going here. <laughs> this is a whole nother conversation. Interesting. But, you know, all these are sources of conflict, certainly. So the next form is we need to talk. When a, a blow-up happens in the office, in the committee, in the choir, in whatever group you're in, one person fills up, you just get, they're upset. Hold on, I know you're upset. We're going to deal with this, but remember, we all agreed to use the toolkit now. So you take this toolkit back, you introduce the toolkit to everybody, you do my workshop for them, and then, or have me come in and do it, I'll be happy to do it. And then they get to have the toolkit and say, this is where we deal with that. So now, the person who has the upset, the person who's angry, who's been offended, whose feelings have been hurt, my observation, this is what I saw, this is what I heard. Objective as possible, writing down what is the issue raised, and then they talk about the issue. What are my concerns around the issue? And every concern has a request. Every objection has a request. What's my request? It's amazing how often, and your feedback is elicited, I'd love to hear those of you that take these forms and use these forms. I think about half the time the people solve the problem themselves just filling out the form. They sit down, they write out what happened, what they heard, what they saw, what the issue was that was raised, and sometimes they come up with a solution themselves. They don't even need to go to the next step 
which we'll come to in a minute, but they'll just go to the other person and say, you know, I was really upset when you said that, but I thought, you know, if you just you close the refrigerator when you're done so it doesn't melt all the ice, would you do that? And ask you to do something like that. I mean, maybe something simple, maybe something really easy. So they, by going through the process of writing it down, it causes them to do the analysis, and very often they'll come up with their own solution. So this is the we need to talk form. This is the form they fill out. If you're the EPA person, employee rep, uh, you give one to the person who's upset, and you deliver it to the other person, and you may be the one that facilitates the dispute resolution protocol, page nine. And this is how you conduct the conflict resolution process. Can you explain EPA? Not maybe everybody doesn't know what it is. Employee Assistance Professionals. Um, I uh, have a lot of respect for the mental health professionals, mostly LCSWs and LMFT, who work in large companies with employees who have all these problems. And that's how this thing got started, was, uh, for uh, people who do employee assistance. And maybe something you want to add to your, uh, your menu. Maybe uh, you thought about, hey, you know, I'd like to take some of the skills I have now, some of the things I've learned and take it to a new level. So one of the things you might consider is offering your services as an employee assistance professional. So, and there's a group. Uh, I'm in the San Fernando Valley chapter. I've been a member for many years, and we have meetings, and you can find out all about it online. So dispute resolution protocol, what I observed, this is the first person talking. So the first person who filled out the form, what it meant, how it made me feel, what I need, what I want, my proposal. So the first person who has the upset, who called the meeting, does this. Then the second person doesn't object, doesn't interfere, doesn't debate, doesn't argue. They listen and they take notes. Only one person can talk at a time. It doesn't work when two people are talking. If you have two transmitters and no receiver, how much communication is going on? <laughs> Zero. Zero. There has to be a transmitter and there has to be a receiver. And so the invitee, the protocol, starts out as the receiver, listening, <laughs> taking notes. They're going to be given their opportunity. They're going to be given their time. And then they go through the same steps. Here's what I observed. I can only talk about what I say and what I did, and here's what I meant by that, and here's how I was feeling about it when I said it and when I did it. Here's what I need in this space that we share as colleagues, and here's what I want, and here's my proposal. By taking them through this process, what are you creating? Clarity. Insight. Understanding. Revelation. It's rare for people not to solve their own problems, given the time and the opportunity to do so. So, I already talked about the rules for fair fighting. I put it in here because I, I used to mention it, and people came up to me after this workshop and said, why don't you put in the rules for fair fighting? Okay, I'll put in the rules for fair fighting. This is for couples, but it can also be for friends, it can be for family members, it can be for colleagues. Fighting is okay, fighting is good, fighting is healthy, fighting is natural, fighting is normal, it's how you do it. And when you follow these rules, so I'm, I'm wrapping it up. All right. I'm not going to spend the next five minutes on the next three pages. But somebody asked me what was the most important thing I've learned in my 45 years of law practice. How to be a better listener. It's the hardest thing for me, and maybe difficult for some of you, but I found this, and I thought, wow, deep listening. I need to know more about what deep listening is. And you can actually read through these next three pages and learn more about that. And the last thing that's on the uh, toolkit is the um, have a soup by talking stick. Anybody know about the uh, Havasupai? They're the uh, indigenous people at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. They're the ones that reportedly, reputedly invented the talking stick. And that ceremony in the protocol is like an abbreviated version. But if you haven't done, is there anyone here that's done a talking stick ceremony? Wow! 
that's the most responsive, and usually one or two people, and here we have about six. Uh, it's life changing. When I teach ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, Mediation, Collaborative Law at the university, I give the students the assignment to pick somebody that they care about with whom they have an upset to do the talking stick ceremony. And I, I get the whole class crying when they tell the story. I had a, I had a mother who was, uh, her husband died, she took the inheritance his insurance policy and went to law school for four years because she knew that her money was going to run out uh, in four years if she didn't do something. So she went to law school, became a lawyer, and <clears throat> she was having big problems with her 17-year-old daughter who was just going nuts. She went home, did the talking stick. They both cried and held each other. And it was the best talk they'd ever had in their life. And, you know, they were both grieving the loss of the same man. So it was typical. So, the last page I'm going to ask you to tear off, the very, very last page, if you learn anything today, if that was at all helpful, I would really covet your feedback, your ideas, your suggestions, your thoughts on how to improve this, how to make it better. Um, and I'll be around for pictures if anybody wants to take pictures because my son who's my social media leader, <laughs> said, we need to get pictures for Facebook. <laughs> so I'll take pictures if anybody wants to have my picture. Um, I just wanted to say to my parents who have been married for 51 years, and um, it's just so unusual today, and you're just an amazing man, it, and probably, and your wife also. And I just, I loved your, I loved everything about you. And I wanted you to know that. She um, gets all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> my mom too, but yeah. I, no. I, you know, as Freud said, men marry women, hoping they won't change. Women marry men, hoping they will. <laughs> and the divorces are the ones in the middle. So it's a journey. It's a thank you. Those very kind words. So any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much.